Okay, so um, so I'm going to be talking about shell scripting with Elixir, and uh, because I because uh, this was kind of <laughs> sort of last minute, I'm not uh, I'm not anticipating me talking a lot and everyone else listening. I mean, I I, I always say I want people to kind of interact with me. Um, and in this case, I really do want you to interact with me. And if you have questions, ask them and all that, because, uh, because honestly, I, I don't have my speaker notes handy. And so I'm just going to kind of wing it. So we'll see. Um, so what are we going to talk about? First, we're going to talk about what's a shell, what's a shell script, why you'd write shell scripts, why you would not write shell scripts and well, in a scripting language, um, most shells, shells have their own kind of like scripting language, purpose built, you know, like uh, Bash has, you know, a Bash scripting language and KSH has its KSH scripting language and Zish, ZSH has its own scripting language and they're, they're all various flavors. Um, so there's reasons why you would probably not want to script in those languages. Then, you know, the important thing for, for this conversation, how do you run a shell script with Elixir? Uh, people who care about Elixir, what is the difference between an EX file and EXS? Uh, how you pass in command line arguments? Um, how can you share common code between scripts? And that's specific to Elixir. There are other scripting languages that are also good options. I'm just talking about Elixir, but I'll mention some of the other ones. And then what are some of the drawbacks of shell scripting with Elixir? specifically with Elixir, so. Okay, let's see here. And as I said, if you have a question, feel free, raise your hand. Um, you know, the reason I ask people to raise their hand first is that we're not talking over each other, honestly. Stop me anytime. Uh, God knows I have no hammer lock on uh, explaining concepts well. So if I'm not explaining something very well and you're thinking, what the heck is an Oreo talking about? Please stop me. Uh, because I don't realize when I'm not explaining things as well as I could be, because to me, it all makes sense. It's all up here and therefore it all makes sense. And if I'm not getting that out through my mouth, I need to know. <laughs> okay. So what is a shell? <clears throat> Actually, you could probably call a shell a layer. Um, it's a, and this goes back to old, you know, old, um, terminology in computer work. Actually, it also, you could probably call it a terminal. And that's probably what most of you are, would be familiar with is like looking at a terminal. Uh, it's basically, if you think about it, an operating system allows us to abstract away hardware issues. If I had to write code to like fetch a file from the hard drive and the, the code had to go through and say, okay, first read the file allocation table and find the, the pointer to the first chunk of this file. And then find the, the point of the next chunk of the file and all that, we'd get nothing done because we'd be constantly writing these low-level routines, right? And we don't want to do that. So the operating system presents that stuff to us in, in the form of APIs, which we, we call from our programming code, like our C, our C++, stuff like this, and also in the form of the shell, the shell allowing us to directly do some of these operations that we need to do on the hardware, okay? So that's what a shell is. Part of the reason they call it a shell is because at least in Windows, I'm sorry, take that back. Well, I actually true in Windows too. In Linux and Mac OS X, you can substitute your shell. You don't have to necessarily use the one that's su supplied by default. On Linux and Mac OS X, like I said, there's Bash, there's a, a corn shell, KSH, there's a C shell, CSH. And there's several different flavors that you can use and, you, you know, whatever you're happiest with. And honestly, uh, it's not something that most people do on Windows, but it is possible to use a different terminal emulator on Windows to present a different shell. So that's part of the reason you would call it a shell. Okay. Uh, before I forget to mention, I did forget to mention this on the other presentation I did. Uh, there are three things that are also real important about the shell. Uh, standard input standard output and standard error. Uh, these are basically like if you don't tell the shell or your operating system otherwise, it assumes it's gonna get input from the standard input, which is the keyboard. 
the output's going to go to the standard output, which is the console or the terminal. And errors will go to the standard error stream, which in this case is also the console, is the standard. But you can redirect any of those. So if I redirect standard in, instead of having to have things come in from the keyboard, I could have them come in from a file. If I redirect standard out, instead of things having gone out to the console, I can save them to a file. And this is a very handy thing to do, okay? As I said, there's really, when you talk about shell scripts, you're basically talking about like instructions to the shell. Uh, in Windows, there was the command shell, the CMD shell, which is the terminal problem with most people who use Windows for a long time are familiar with. Uh, around, I want to say it was 2016, they introduced something called PowerShell, which is a lot closer to what you have available to you on Linux and Mac OS X. It's a lot closer to Bash, uh, but it's got some neat things there for, uh, for doing sh uh, shell scripting on Windows. And on Windows... And really on all three of them, on Windows, Mac OS X and Linux, you've got scripting languages that are kind of purpose built for scripting like Python, like Ruby, and like uh, another one called TCLTK, which is not as well known as Python and Ruby, but it's also an option. Um, and as I said before, one of the reasons they call it a shell is you can swap out different ones. You can also, you know, on Mac OS X and Linux, it's a little easier. On Windows, not so easy, but still possible. Um, on Mac OS X, the default shell, if I remember correctly, is Bash. Same thing on Linux, if I remember correctly. Um, the one thing about Linux is there's a notation, and you, this also applies to Mac OS X, but not to Windows. There's a special notation, hash sign, uh, bang, the exclamation point. That is a special notation that tells the shell script, hey, I want you to run with this scripting language or with this um, shell. And it's really handy because that way you can basically have a, a .sh extension, no matter what it is, and it will know how to run it for you, which can be really, really helpful on certain uh, points. So. Let's see, let's move on. Like I say, one thing too, I should point out at this point, when I'm talking about scripting, Python, Ruby, TCLTK, the stuff I'm gonna show you in Elixir, almost all of these can support basically these things I'm showing you. Uh, I can't show you how to do them in Python and Ruby and TCLTK because I just don't know them that well, but the same ideas apply about redirecting standard in, about redirecting standard out and standard error, those same ideas apply. So don't think this is only Elixir. What I'm gonna show you is, is Elixir syntax and stuff like that, but these things apply to Ruby and Python too. Okay. So why would you bother to write shell scripts? Uh, for me, it's uh, automating stuff. Uh, I am... I, ha I have a copy of the Pragmatic Programmer by Dave Hunt and, uh, and Andy Thomas. Dave Thomas? Dave Thomas and Andy Hunt. <laughs> and one of the things they point out in there, and I can't remember exactly where in the book it is, they say automate everything you can. And I, I'm a big believer in that. Automate everything you can because automation doesn't forget steps. Automation, when you write a shell script, it doesn't forget oh yeah, boy, I got to create this directory first before I do so-and-so and, -so, and I got to do this and I got to do that. So that's that's really a good reason to write a shell script. And shell scripts give you the ability to do things between applications too. Like if you had the need to grab like a CSV file from some like secure FTP site, well, there's a couple ways you could do that. You could write it in your high level language and find the libraries to get the FTP and to get the, you know, the secure FTP and all this and download the CSV file to a directory. And then it, probably chances are you, if you're using Windows, you want to pull it up in Excel and stuff like this. Uh, whereas a shell script would probably make it a lot easier. You just figure out how to script the secure FTP client to grab the file for you, put it in a particular directory, and then start up Excel with the CSV file in it. Okay. 
that's what shell scripts are really good for. Um, also, as most developers will know, you don't want to repeat yourself. The reason you don't want to repeat yourself is because anytime you repeat something and have uh, have the same basic thing in more than one place, you're going to, you're taking the chance you're going to forget to change it later on. Because all of us know that working code, part of the definition of working code is it's going to need to be changed. And when we forget, you know, when we have the same code in multiple places, then we forget to change it one place and we run into problems. I was telling somebody one of the first... <laughs> One of the first lessons I learned when I started doing event-driven code was way back in the day I was working on a DOS application and it had like a, a character-based UI. And um, I did not realize, didn't occur to me that, you know, up in the upper uh, right corner, there was an X and then I had a file exit, right? And I wrote two different code paths for that. Didn't think about it. Was dumb and had a bug. When they clicked the X, it would do one thing. When they file X, it would do a different thing. And it's like, I, I, for the longest time, I couldn't reproduce the problem because like, hey, I, I don't have any problem. I click the X, fine. Finally occurred to me to watch what they were doing. And then, oh, they're doing file X. Oh, that's where the problem is. So this is why repeating yourself is a bad idea. <laughs> um, the other thing about shell scripts, and this is like, you know, I guess to me, it's a kind of a mixed blessing. There's no UI available to you. Um, so, you know, that is good in the sense of if you want to run something in what they would call a batch mode, where um, where it's run like off hours or something with no human interaction is basically what batch mode means. Uh, the no UI is great because you don't have to worry about somebody having to click something or, um, you know, have to respond to something or anything like this. Uh, again, once upon a time, had somebody write a shell script, but the shell script, and they didn't test it thoroughly enough, popped up a, a modal dialog. And it didn't take us very long to figure out, hey, it's not running. What's going on with this? And we ran it ourselves because we hadn't thought to run it before. And there's this modal dialog, and it's like, okay, this is not good. We don't want modal dialogs because this is going to run at midnight, and there's going to be nobody sitting there to click on the OK button on that modal dialog. So um, anyway, this is one of the good things about shell scripts. It makes it possible for you to run things off hours when you don't have a lot of users around so that you don't have to worry about stepping on users and this kind of thing. So let's see. So why not write shell scripts? One thing, performance. Most shell scripts are interpreted. Interpreted means like it's not pre parsed into like an abstract syntax tree and pre, you know, turned into, um, pre-turned into like machine code and stuff like that. So it's never going to perform as well as something written in a high level language that's comp uh, compiled down into machine language. It just isn't. For most part, that's actually not usually a problem because a lot of times shell scripts, you're going to want to tinker with them anyway. And having, you know, having them easy to tinker with is, you know, is a good thing. Um, they're not terribly secure. Um, anybody who has access to the shell script can run it usually. There's ways you can make it more secure, but just bear in mind that, you know, you're kind of opening up a little bit of a hole in your security with a shell script. And the last thing, and to me, this is why, this is why it's really interesting and worthwhile to talk about writing shell scripts in Elixir or Python or Ruby the basic shell script you get like in Bash or Zish or something like this, they have a lot of nice features, but they just don't have everything that's available to you in a high-level language. Let's say you want to parse a JSON file for some reason. Uh, you get a response from a, a web endpoint. You want to parse a JSON file and then have your shell script act on that. That's really, really tough to do in a straight scripting language like Bash or Zish or stuff like this. Whereas if you do it in a higher level language, like Elixir or something like that, you've got the whole library available to you. You've got everything that Elixir has available to it, available to you in your shell script. And that's really handy. So, all right. So how do I run an Elixir shell script? And of course, this is specific to Elixir. Uh, if you're looking at Python or Ruby or something like that, you'd have to figure out. Um, 
you can do simply Elixir with the script name that in this case is the .exx extension and I'll explain what the difference is there. You can do dot slash script name dot uh, and this is this is down to um, something that Mac and Unix do, Linux do, <laughs> whatever <laughs> that is not present on Windows. Uh, on Windows, if you have a, a, a file in the current directory, Windows looks at the current directory first to see if a file's there when you go to run it. Linux and Mac do not. Mac and Linux will not say, oh, if it's in the current directory, pick it up and run it. And the reason for this is actually security. If somebody were to, some bad actor were to put like, say, ls is the uh, directory command on Linux. If some bad actor were to copy their own version of ls into your root home directory, right? And you ran it from there and, and Linux just ran it you would have no way of telling. So by forcing you to say, hey, I want to run the run that's right in this directory here, it's actually a little more secure. So that's what the dot slash is about. That's saying run this script name.exs that's in this directory right here. At the top of that script name.exs, and I'll show you an example in a few minutes, you put this shebang notation, and then you tell it, use us or bin environment and that's the path to there's a there's an environment executable, and I want to run this with Elixir. And when I first did this presentation, somebody asked me about, hey, I've been doing a bunch of stuff with Mix. Mix is Elixir's tool for like project management and um, oh, all kinds of little you know automations you want to do with Elixir. And they said, hey, I've been doing a lot of stuff with uh, with Mix, and is there a way to run a script? with mix and at first I said well I don't know that's a good question so I did a little digging and if you do mix run and there's also an option on mix which I did not know about until I, I was doing this research called no mix exs uh which will tell it hey this is not a project this is just a single file I want to run and then the script name that will work um if you do have a project and you want to run something like a script name like that inside of the project, then you do mix script name, I think will work. Or maybe IEX, maybe IEX dash X. I don't know. But anyway, it's not it's not a common use case that comes up, so I don't worry a ton about it. Okay, so I'm going to show you by sharing my screen. And this is, this is the link, and I can share that later on too, but let me... Go ahead and share my screen here. Let's see, share screen. Can I get a thumbs up if you guys can see that screen okay? Okay, cool. I've been trying to figure out how to get this font bigger on this REPL it, which I use, and I haven't quite been able to figure it out. I apologize, that font's a bit small. Um, let me see. And I still can't seem to figure out how to get that font bigger. Just a sec. I'm sorry. Um, let's see. I'm just going to, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just going to do this right now. I apologize for it. I mean, a, a quick way to do it is just to do the control plus, right? But that is going to expand the other parts of the UI as well. So, right. Ah, settings. Okay. There we go. So I go to. Where's settings at? Yeah, I'll, uh, while he's doing that, I'll mention really quick, one of the ways to make sure that um, your scripting is at least a little more secure, right, is to use stuff like secrets and whatnot. And you can even do this in, in REPL, I'm sure. I think everybody, at least the three of us, are pretty familiar with that. But for anybody else that's listening to this even in the future, right, 
um, highly suggest that in any bash scripts you're writing that you're not embedding the uh, secret creden secrets or credentials right in the script, right, ever. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and then I can look at this because I think I think actually, strangely enough, the thing that would let me set the font bigger is hidden under the sharing bar. Just a second. Gotcha. OK. All right. I guess I'm wrong. Where is the settings? Yeah, another another quick note about automations. You're right, they don't skip steps, but one of the things that I would highly suggest and has been beneficial to us in the past is to make sure that you're you're logging uh, the output because, you know, like, yes, they might be the right steps today, but uh, third party applications especially change over time and uh, having some logging and then maybe that output to something, a tool like Datadog or whatnot, right, where you can create alerts off of that if that bash script fails. I mean, there's, there's definitely, um, you know, some additional steps you could take to make sure that this is going to run long term. And when it doesn't run, at least you know about it and you can fix it, right? Right. Um, okay, so this example here, you can see on line one, I've got my hash shebang. And ironically, that pound sign is the, the comment character for both the shell script, almost every shell scripting language on Linux, and for Elixir. So it, it, like, it, it doesn't, it hurts nothing at all to have it there. Um, so this is, and I apologize to those that don't have a background in Elixir. This is Elixir code. So what I've done is I define define a module called is sudo. This is a utility thing I had done myself, uh, basically to tell if the current user is a sudo user or not, um, because I I needed to know. And this is, would not be something I would normally do standalone like this. I would normally use it from other scripts to say is this a sudo user, and if it is, then go ahead and run sudo to change it. Um, so I, uh, just to show you how it works, one thing you'll notice here on line 61, I have to actually invoke the function that I've created up there in, um, in my module. It doesn't automatically run. I have to say, okay, I've defined the sudo module. It will compile it. It'll put it into memory. And then in the is pseudo module, there's show answer function, and I have to run that. That's something that's, I don't know if that's true of all, um, all shell scripting languages. It's definitely true of this one though. Let me show you. So this is how I would run it. I do dot slash is pseudo dot EXS, which is the name. Just hit enter. And it tells me my current username is runner. And it tells me my user runner is not a member of the sewers group. So kind of handy. Um, you'll notice that here on 54 and 55, the IL puts goes to the console. That's the standard out for this. Um, let me see. Anything else interesting here? One thing I, I did notice, and this is uh, something that... Um, it's something I, you know, I had to find out the hard way, which was apparently on an Apple, uh, the Mac OS X, the Mac, whatever it is, the OS is called, uh, it behaves slightly differently as far as which group uh, sudoers are in. Um, this group that sudoers are in on an Apple is an admin group. On the other hand, on every other, like Linux and that is a pseudo group. Um, oh, one thing to notice here too, uh, in this case, just because of the way that groups command behaves, and this is something that, if, you know, if, you, if you're doing shell script, you're just going to have to play with and find out. Because of the way that the groups command behaves, I've got to redirect standard error to standard output on this one. And this is how I tell this how to do it in... Elixir's particular vernacular is I say, you know, pass a standard standard error to standard out atom, 
set to true. I'm sorry, not a keyword is the right thing. Set to true. And that says, okay, when you run this command, this groups command, take it standard error and put it to standard out instead. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do that, like in a regular shell, um, which I won't go over right this minute. But for this, this is how you do it with Elixir. And this, and it's just down to basically the way the groups command works. Okay. So now to show you a little more, um, this is um, something I'd done because one thing that I, I found myself doing all the time, and maybe you guys do this too, is I need to um to um every day make sure my development branch on git was updated with all the changes from the main branch and it's easy to forget and i it's like man i'm doing this every day i go you know get uh get main and then get rebase my development off of main and all this stuff and it's like man this is really repetitive and this is dumb i'm a developer this i automate this kind of stuff so I wrote this shell script uh, initially as one shell script and then, you know, did, went back and did some refactoring to take and make it into like this portion, the utility portion it could be reused by other things. Um, so there's a few utility things in there. It's like, um, does the branch exist? I get, I get the branch name. If the branch exists, it hands me back a true. And if the branch doesn't exist, it hands me back a false. And that way I can tell. Uh, like, you know, do I have, because uh, on, on newer versions of, or newer instances of Git, it's main by default, and older ones is master by default, and so I can't always be sure I've got master, I've got main. So having a branch exist allows me to do that. Um, set branch just basically tells it, hey, I want to switch to this other branch, and again, just a handy utility thing. Uh, I have a squash commits, that lets me, you know, squash a bunch of commits, no doubt. <laughs> um, so none of this is all that terribly interesting. And you'll notice this time I don't invoke anything to run it at the end. This is because I include this get utility I EX. I keep saying I'm going to say what the difference is with EAX and EXS. And I should say that right now. EX, uh, both of those EX and EXS are compiled to what's called a beam file which is uh, Beam is the virtual machine for Erlang. Uh, and the the code that runs on the virtual machine goes into a binary with an extension dot Beam. The dot EX, the Beam is retained after it's run. The dot EXS, the Beam is discarded. That's the difference. Other than that, there is no difference. So if you have something that you, you know, you, you're pretty confident you're going to have to keep modifying it, monkeying with it, there's no point in saving it, then use an EXS because, you know, that way you don't have to worry about it overwriting the beam or anything like that. If it's something you're confident is going to be, you know, pretty consistently used, then use an EX. But honestly, that's, that's the difference. Okay, so this is my update trunk branch from Origin. And I call it git update trunk and it's got dot EXS. Again, one of the nice things about Elixir, they are very, they are very, and this is something that's a little harder to do in like normal scripting. They're very uh, focused on making sure there's good documentation on things. So they give you like lots of nice ways to add documentation to things. For me, I have, a, I have a problem remembering command parameters, um, what they are and exactly how to specify them in this. So I, so I even put right in there, hey, line 15, uh, to pass the trunk branch name, it's minus minus trunk space name, and it defaults to master. And so that if I wanted, I wanted to use, uh, in this case, actually, if you look at line 27, I set it to main and I should have set it default main up here. I just didn't get, get around to doing it. But um, same thing, the dry run parameter is basically like if you've ever used Git and you can do, there's certain Git parameters that you can use to, uh, to just show you what would happen if you ran the command without actually running the command. And that's what the idea of that dry run is. Um, 
mainly this like i say this is mainly an example to show a couple things one how to include different elixir scripts and two how to specify command line arguments there's a nice way to get command line arguments built in it's called option parser it's a uh it's a, a library that's available within elixir that lets you do um command line arguments like that that's really handy i would say in general if you have more than one or two command line arguments, probably a shell script is probably not your best friend. Um, you probably want to go to to like a higher level thing or build some kind of UI to let somebody specify those parameters. But for one or two, it's fine. Um, how do you in how do you get this uh, get utility into my Git update trunk? Well, I use this fetch dependencies. I basically say to a, okay, uh, get the environment variable home. And there's another way to get the home home value, the home directory. And I forget what it is off the top of my head, but get, get the home directory from the environment variable home and append to it this, uh, what looks like greater than less than is actually a string append in Elixir. Uh, append to it shell scripting with Elixir. So you see here, I'm, I'm actually at shell scripting with Elixir, right? And then a code require file to tell it the file that I want to pull in and where is it where is it located? And that's what the base util there is about. So once I run that git fetch dependencies, it pulls in the definition of git utility and everything that's available in git utility is now available to me. Okay. Um, I like, I like, again, to avoid repeating myself on things. So you'll notice here that I've registered a couple of attributes. There's a success error level and there's no arguments passed. And over here, I use my success error level. I don't, I don't need to use the arg no arguments passed. This allows me to define it in one module and use it in others. So I have one definition, so I don't have to worry about, like, again, repeating myself, having the definition more than one place. Of course, this is going to come down to your particular programming language, how you share values between, like, units of code. This is just how I do it. Um, so basically, once I've got all this done, then I'll say, okay, get the current branch name, which branch am I currently sitting on, and toss it into this current branch variable. Then get the trunk branch I specify in the command line. So in this case, the trunk branch is default to main. And if I don't pass a dash dash trunk argument like this, then it's going to use main. And this is set up. The get trunk branch from command line is set up such that it will you know default to main unless I pass something differently. Uh, if I'm not on the trunk branch, then I want to set the trunk branch. Then I want to update that branch from the back end. Then I want to go back to the branch that was current. And then I want to do a merge to put, you know, pull the changes from main or master or whatever into my current development branch. And so, as I say, that's basically all it does is just basically make it real simple for me to pull my changes from main or master so I don't have to worry about forgetting to pull them. Okay. And I will stop sharing that. Okay, and where is my slide deck? Command slide deck. Huh. I'm not seeing the slide deck. Oh, there it goes, finally. I, Is that I, something you I, had to do, Mike? I, yeah, I, I did it. Yeah, it was, it was sitting down there. Okay, that's weird. Huh. Okay, as I say, if you if you're interested in seeing this stuff, there's the link, and I'll send I can send the link along if you're curious to see how this is done on Elixir. It's probably interesting to Mike and I. <laughs> Maybe not the rest of you. <laughs> okay, so again, why would I do Elixir shell scripting? I, I've listed a couple things. One, you get the Elixir the Erlang language, all the stuff that's there. Elixir is great for high concurrency, high throughput, uh, a lot of fault tolerance built right into it. It's really nice for that. Uh, so all that stuff is great. 
the beam is the virtual machine that Elixir and Erlang runs on. Again, at one point, it was like, I want to say it was 2013, Joe Armstrong, who was the creator of Erlang, uh, had mentioned that like half of the world's telecom traffic went through uh, Erlang, the beam. That to me is absolutely astounding. How many other languages, how many other platforms can you think of where half of the entire world's, you know, like developers all agree we're going to run this on this? And that maybe COBOL, maybe Fortran, but that there's not a lot I can think of where it's like half of everybody runs it on this. So Erlang is definitely doing something right. And it's still very heavily used in telecom because it gives people the ability to do things that just are just really a lot harder to do if you don't have those nice abstractions that the beam presents you. Beyond that, the benefit of shell scripting and like in a higher level language, I don't know about anyone else on this call, but for a long time there, I was doing Elixir and Erlang, not as my day job, but as kind of like on my, on my own, I'm, as a hobby on the side. Writing shell scripts in that language is a great way to keep it in practice too. Because it's, as we all know, if you don't practice something, it goes away really fast. Uh, I'm getting to the point now where I look at C sharp and I have to, I have to scratch my head for a second and remember how C sharp works because it's been a while since I've done C sharp. Um, this is a way to practice this language that you want to practice. Let's say you were really deeply into Haskell. You said, "Hey, Haskell's great. I love Haskell, but I can't find a job doing it." While you're working on getting that job, you can use Haskell to write yourself shell scripts. And that will keep your Haskell in practice. It'll help you to learn how to use Haskell more effectively. It's it's a real win-win, especially when you're talking about shell scripts, because almost never do shell scripts go into production. So no one's going to care if you write it in like, oh, I wrote it in Erlang. You know, or if they give you grief about writing it in some off language, well, hey, it's a shell script. I wrote it for myself, you know. You want, to, you want it in this other language? You want it in C-sharp? Then write it yourself. No one's stopping you, <laughs> you know? So that to me is like the biggest benefit of writing a shell script in a higher level language. Of course, there's a couple drawbacks. Of course, there's a limited UI, of course. And that to me is like a mixed blessing, you know? I don't have to worry about stuff getting, um, you know, having to have somebody there to run stuff. But if you if you need a decent UI, there are ways to do a decent UI with Elixir and Erlang without even having to drop to a web thing. Uh, it's just it's a little more work. And the other drawback is, and then this this is true of a lot of uh, shell scripting with like Python or Ruby or even Haskell or Idris or something like that. It could be hard to share with other people. I at one point. In my career, I was playing with F Sharp, which is the .NET functional language. And I had hacked together something because they had these uh, shared machines that you would, you know, virtual desktop into. And the way they set up the machines was that when you virtual desktoped in, anybody who was on the machine was just knocked right off, which was to me, it's like, that's really rude. <laughs> so what I did was I wrote a little F Sharp script they had a website you could check to see if someone was using it. And that's what you're supposed to do. Check the website. Are they using it? Then don't go in. So I wrote a little F sharp script to scrape the website for me. Tell me if someone was using it. And then if no one was using it, go ahead, get log in. Otherwise put up a message to me. Hey, so-and-so is using this. Try back later. And it was really handy. It kept me from stepping on other people's toes. People were happy with it. So I had a few people ask me, hey, can I get that script too? And I said, yeah, not really, because I, I got, I'd got i have to install the F-sharp runtime and they really don't want me installing the F-sharp runtime and all of this. Um, so like I say that can be a little bit of a problem. It, to me, it's not such a drawback because honestly, most of the time I write shell scripts, I run it for myself. What's you know, the some... what's what's like the easy way, like the minimum viable, rather than just doing it a REPL it, what what are the requirements for someone to get this running on their machine in Ario? You mean like Erlang or 
Yeah, like so the so, so like what do they need in order to run the elixir script for bash scripting? I don't think you've covered that, even though I know what it is, kind of. I mean, I've done it before, and um, it, it would be good to like list. Well, see, the, for us, we've got yeah. elixir already, so exactly. it's like no biggie. Uh, there is a there's another option I didn't bother to discuss, which is called eScript. eScript allows you to build something like a binary, and you can package it up with like the Erlang runtime. Um, that would be an option. Um, that's one of the tricky things is like, if you wrote like a mixed project, one of the things that allows you to do is do deployment and deployment should only package up what you need in terms of like the runtime and, you know, I, and then you can zip it all up and send it over to somebody's machine. This is, uh, this is generally an issue with like, uh, almost anything that does shell scripting is like, it can be really hard to like give somebody just a simple executable. Right. Yeah. It's almost like, Hey, here's this Docker environment. This is how you run it. And we, you know, like we mapped to these volumes or whatever. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's heavy, right? Like you're talking about the difference between writing some, a bash script, which is pretty much omnipresent on in most places to, Hey, we've got to download a whole environment to run our right. run our bash script, right? So, right, um, yeah. yeah, that was that was one of the big things that I see being a little bit of a drawback from it, right? In the same breath, there are people who don't mind install or already, like you said, already have Elixir and Erlang on their machines, and they could just you know use it, uh, but that's not going to be the majority, right? Like unless they're in that in the community. Yeah. And for me, for the most part, if, you know, if it be, goes beyond something relatively simple, like this one script is just there for me, allowing me to update my development branch from master or main. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty simple. That's pretty straightforward. I don't really worry yeah. about that because um, if something were to go off the rails, it's going to pop up a message for me right away and show me, hey, things really went off the rails. And mm -hmm. so I can't trust this. If it were something that was more involved and more complicated, then like, yeah, drop to drop to a higher level language and create a real executable. You know, mm -hmm. um, this is just, yeah, this really kind of is for like the, the simple task that we have to, well, all of us as developers have to do over and over again. Like mm -hmm. I need to, on a new machine, I need to install these various uh, components for, um, for development work for myself. Well, this, I write a shell script, I put it on my machine, and then it, all the stuff that I need is there, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. That, that's another thing more and more I've been using, using just Docker environments for quick little things that I need to do just because, like, it's completely sandboxed, right? So. Right, right. And that's, and that's an, also a real good option. It's like, you know, a Docker environment, then you don't have to worry. Uh, Repolit actually uses a tool called Nix. Which oh, is that Nix, like Nix OS? I don't think I've ever used yeah. it, but I've heard it a lot. Nix OS, yeah. Which what it does is it lets you build an environment where it's like basically a throwaway environment. I install Elixir. I install um, VS Code, all this stuff into this Nix OS. And when it's done... It's, it, I shut it down and it's as if it were never there. Huh. So that really is slick to me. I may have to play around with that. I, I feel like it's one of those things that's been on the list for like in the back of my mind for a while because I hear good things about it. But yeah, that, that, that's interesting. I'm always looking for ways to keep my main box unpolluted. Yeah, that's very handy too. Um, well, finally... In conclusion, there's a couple of points. If you don't remember any other points I made, I'd like you to remember these. Um, one, when I'm talking about these shell scripts, I use it, I use it just basically for minor, you know, non-production stuff that I do for myself. Because if it's production work, you know, you want to do it in the language that you know that production is done in. And if it's beyond something minor, then it's probably worth your time to invest in doing it, you know, the right way. Um, and the second thing is that this, you know, using Elixir or using Python or Ruby or whatever it is, gives you the ability to write richer scripts that can deal with more, you know, deal with things in a better way, not so much hacky way. So, right. That makes sense. Yeah.
And that's my contact information. Gosh, that really, that color. That really yellow, that yellow is killer, well, man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, that's like I if you wanted that, to encrypt something and you just like want, yeah. wanted to make like a mind bender. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I can swear I put it in blue on the slide, man. <laughs> um, like the rest of that code. Anyway, um, I know it sometimes happens that people, you know, even if you say to them, hey, ask me questions while I'm going, people are shy or they don't realize they have a question until after they think, think about it for a while. And that's fine. If you realize you have a question later on, just send me a note and I'll be happy to answer it best I can. Uh, and that's how you can contact me if you realize you have a question later on. So, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it. 